Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias por estar aquí. Yo creo que aún estamos un poco conmovidos por el documental. We are still a bit moved by the documentary that we have just seen. Before we start this event, I would like to rememorate and maybe ask for a few seconds or half a minute of silence. I want to remind people that it is the 30th day of the Palestinian prisoners that are on a hunger strike in the Israeli prisons. So we should pay tribute to the resistance and the strength of the Palestinian population who, through these prisoners, is giving us a true lesson of life. Thank you. Bueno. Well, to, first I would like to thank Casa Arabe for having brought uh, Professor Nur Masalma to commemorate the anniversary of the Nakba with a rigorous uh, reminder as the documentary that we have just seen, this valuable film, and the contribution of the great Palestinian Palestinian historian uh, Nur uh, Masalma. And on a personal note, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity of uh, introducing him because I admire his work um, dearly. This is the seventh decade from the Nakba. The Nakba did not start in 48. It started in 1947, immediately after the partition resolution of Palestine, with the division of Palestine in two states. And it starts before, as we have seen in the documentary, and as I'm sure uh, Professor Masal Masala will explain before uh, with the lack of or the loss of properties of the Palestinian population and the uh, creation of the Israeli state. It is a process, as I was saying, that starts at the end of the 19th century and that little by little goes through different steps and goes through different phases. Some of the speakers in the documentary explain this. We start with the, uh, with the process of buying the land and then from 1920, onwards, they realize that this process will not lead to a state. So then there's an ethnic cleansing um, process that starts in December of 1947 until more or less June 1949 more or less. So this is what we have seen in the documentary and that uh, Professor Masalha has written uh, uh, about uh, rigorously did not happen in the Middle Ages. It happened a few days ago, as uh, so to speak. Um, and something that really moves me is to know that there's no awareness of the dimensions of the tragedy of the lack of justice, injustice, huge injustice, towards the Palestinian people in those years. There's no awareness in Europe, in the among the public opinion, we have all these documents, uh, this has all been studied and proven, but who is aware of this process of ethnic cleansing? Who understands that there's a European responsibility in all this process? We don't have this present. 
not uh, by chance, because in the same way as uh, nearly everything that has happened in Palestine is documented, the registries of the land, etc., it has been rigorously published as all the works of uh, Professor Masal has, but at the same time it has been efficiently hidden silenced. One of the elements of the Palestinian tragedy is this silence, uh, the negation, the denial of uh, this injustice, of the ethnic cleansing, and for this it is important, I think it is very important, to fight against this denial with data and facts. Um, regarding Palestine, but the Palestine, especially in the past, the, the, the one that was just simply Palestine before the Palestine-Israeli conflict, there was a sort of um, spider web that was created uh, through lies and uh, different stories that has impeded the uh, sight of the reality, the suffering of the Palestinian people. We need to take away this uh, veil. We need to destroy this spider web that impedes us uh, to see things. And for this, we need the work of people such as Nur Masalha, who works with documents, testimonies, facts, etc. All these things that the Zionist propaganda has tried to hide. So it is important to reach out to him and peoples like people like him, and this is why there's no better way of resistance as the search for truth. And this is why I am a great admirer of uh, Nur Masala's work, and I think that it is great that Casa Arabe has thought to be able to commemorate this 70th anniversary of the Nakba, to uh, remember how things happened through a great historian uh, as uh, Nur Masala is. So without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to him. It is important to listen to him, to read him, and here I recommend all the attendees that if they want to have a, an honest and rigorous information on Palestine, not only the current Palestine, but the uh, Palestine that was destroyed, and that is uh, the origin of nowadays, and that what will happen next week, and in, in, will be on the news in a days or two time, to it is necessary to understand how everything started, and this has been very well studied and documented through the work of Nur Masalha. Thank you, um, Teresa. Down, okay. Masal uh, here. And, and good evening. Um, you've seen this documentary, and uh, at the end of the documentary, there was something about actually blowing up the Ceramis um, Hotel in Jerusalem in February, and the Spanish consul or the Spanish attache was, was killed in that thing. I don't know whether you have actually paid attention to this, you have noticed this or not. Uh, this is an incident, actually. Maybe it's not remembered in Spain, but we Palestinians actually do remember it. <laughs> and um, that um, documentary you saw, we did it 10 years ago. So this is really the 10th, 10th anniversary of this documentary. But the documentary itself actually based on a book I wrote, I published 25 years ago, uh, called Expulsion of the Palestinians. Um, and the, the documentary is partly based on that book. The book was translated into Spanish and published in Madrid, as well as uh, translated in Argentina in Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. So you've got two different translations. I'm not sure whether they are the same. Um, they, could be, they could be the same. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that book is in Spanish, and I am, have been fortunate to have a number of books also translated into Spanish. 
I've also been very fortunate to speak from this platform about five years ago. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, perhaps I should have actually been by a big thank you to the Arab House for having me again. Yes. Uh, I'm actually becoming regular here, maybe twice, the second time. Some of the people actually already know me. So I'm really very grateful for this opportunity, for the work you're doing here, uh, for the brilliant work you're doing here, and, and for this evening, which is which is so important. I actually want to call 2017 as the year of the Palestinian people. And I want to explain why 2017 is the year of the Palestinian people. It's the year of key anniversaries. Mm -hmm. To begin with, we have the centenary of the Balfour Declaration. 2nd of November, 1917, the Balfour Declaration. This is one of the very beginnings of the conflict, actually. This is not the only beginning, but this is actually a key point in our history. Uh, and the Balfour Day, it was a day where, where Palestinians actually demonstrated from 1920 onwards, every day, Palestinians on the 2nd of November demonstrated. So this is a key anniversary. The second key anniversary is the partition 1947. In fact, I want to argue that the Nakba began with the partition yes. in 1947. Okay. So we've got the second anniversary, which is 70 years. The third anniversary is 1967. Mm -hmm which is June 1967. So we've got three key anniversaries, which makes this year a very a particular year for us in terms of history, in terms of memory, in terms of identity, also in terms of trying to understand the conflict, which has been going on for about 100 years. This is one of the longest conflicts on Earth. At least 100 years going on. Are we going to continue for, for another 100 years? It's quite extraordinary. It's a conflict which is going on for 100 years, and we're still struggling, actually, to try to survive. Now, the Nakba itself, it's an Arabic word for catastrophe. We use it like, uh, uh, as a word for, um, I don't want to use the word holocaust, which is kind of a very sensitive word. So I will stick to the word catastrophe and Nakba. And I want to argue that Nakba is central to our history memory and identity. We Palestinians can't begin to understand our modern history without actually understanding the Nakba. You can really divide the history of Palestine before the Nakba and after the Nakba. And the Nakba is also central to the Palestinian identity of today. Our identity today also is linked in one way or another to the Nakba. The Nakba can be un is understood by the Palestinians in three different ways. First of all, it's understood as a historical event which happened in 1948. In 1948, 80% of Palestine was destroyed. 80% of the country was destroyed. I mean destroyed. Hundreds of villages, really. Five more than 500 villages in town disappeared from them. We're talking about villages which existed for hundreds of years. Some of these villages, we had them 3,000 years ago. 1,000 years before Jesus. By the way, Jesus yes. being a Palestinian yes. himself. Okay? We have some of these villages where, which were wiped out from the map in 1948, existed 1,000 years, 2,000 years before Jesus. Let me give you the name of Tantura. Tantura is a coastal village which is about 20 miles uh, from Haifa, between Haifa and Tantura was demolished in 1948. It was a big massacre in 1948. Tantura, as a historian, actually, we looked at Tantura. Tantura actually existed for 3,200 years, and in 1948 was wiped out. We have many of these villages, they are historic towns, which existed for hundreds and hundreds of years, continuously, non-stop, and then suddenly disappeared from that. I actually want to argue that Palestine was almost wiped out from the map in 1940, almost wiped out. You remember Golda said in 1970, said they didn't exist, they didn't exist. We, we, for them, we, we just didn't exist as people. I, I actually think that in the Nakba, they tried to dissolve us as a people. They wanted to make us. Two thirds of us became refugees in 1948. 80% of the country was destroyed. So the Nakba is such a big event for us. It's so central to the way we understand ourselves. Every single Palestinian family has got relatives who are refugees. I mean, I have relative refugees in Lebanon, in Syria, and in Jordan. Every single, perhaps every single Palestinian in this room has got a relative who is refugee somewhere. We are a nation of refugees. And that's why the Nakba is so important to us today. It's not just an event in the past. 
is also an event uh, of today. Um, but it, it, it really, if you look at the map after 1948, it, actually Palestine actually disappears from the map for a while. It took the Palestinians almost 20 years to reconstitute themselves. The PLO was founded in 1964. It took us nearly 20 years just to recover, to recover the trauma, the dispersion, the, the exile, the, the psychological trauma, the massacres you, you saw here. It took us a long time to just to, to start fighting back to recover, to resist. So the Nakba was such a shattering. Palestinian society was shattered in 1948, and some people started to deny our existence. We have to prove to people that we existed there in our country for hundreds of years before that. It took us a long time. It wasn't easy for us as refugees. First of all, we needed to survive. Refugees, the first thing refugees do, actually try to survive. So it took us a, 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 some time to recover. Uh, uh, after that. So it's, it, we use the term Nakba in terms of describing the catastrophe, catastrophic situation of 1948. But we also use it as in memory and remembrance. Uh, to remember something in English means to re remember. Palestine was dismembered in 1948, dismembered. Remember means actually bringing things together, linking things together. We link ourselves as a people through the Nakba. Palestinians within Israel commemorate the Nakba. Palestinians in Lebanon commemorate. People actually link with each People can't see each other, can't meet. But in fact, remembering is actually one way to unite people, to link people together. It's actually, Nakba Day is one event which actually links us together as a people, even without us meeting physically. So remembering means actually reuniting, uniting the fragment, relinking together. Trying to, trying to say, look, we are a people, we are not minorities. We are not just despaired people. We are not just community. We are not just inhabitants of Judea and Samaria. We are a people. So the Nakba actually is one way of linking ourselves together and say, look, we are a people. We're not going to go here. The Nakba is also, um, we use the Nakba as a continuing Nakba. Sometimes we use the word continuing Nakba. Continuing Nakba in the sense we are still being pushed out of Jerusalem. We live under siege in, in Gaza. Bethlehem is a siege, is a ghetto when you go to Bethlehem. The Palestinian capital, uh, well, administrative center in Rome is actually besieged by Israeli settlements. We live under siege. We've been living under siege since 1967. And our siege is actually, the siege of Palestinian city center is continuing. Palestinians are still being pushed from East Jerusalem through colonization, through... So the Nakba, in a way, it is continuing sl slowly, gradually. They still try to squeeze us out of our country. The strange thing about Palestine, Palestine Palestinians are not the only people who have been colonized. We had colonizations in, in Latin America, in North America, and Palestinians are being colonized in the 21st century. We are still suffering in the 21st century. This is the unique thing about Palestine. It's not that Palestine is unique in terms of oppression and colonization. It's unique that it's still going on now, here and now. And they are getting away with it. They are getting away with Judaization of East Jerusalem. 200,000 settlers in East Jerusalem, hundreds of thousands of settlers in the West Bank. The number of settlers on the West Bank doubled itself since Oslo. We're still facing threats. We're still fighting for self We're still fighting just to survive as a people in our own country. We're not asking for the moon. We're just asking to live in dignity in our own country. The Nakba is continuing in the sense of being, people are still being pushed out, squeezed out by the apartheid wall. And the threat of people who are living on the west side of the wall, I was actually looking at, uh, see, I was in, uh, in Cuba on holiday with my wife, and looking at CNN, CNN is supposed to be a moderate sort of bit like Al Jazeera. And CNN was talking about the apartheid wall as a border between Israel. It's not a border. It's inside the West Bank. It's not on the border. They're not building. Also, they're building walls every, around the cities and towns. There's multiple walls. We're still facing threat of evictions from Silwan in the city of Jerusalem. They're still Judaizing. People are being. This is the continuation of the Nakba. You can't understand the situation now without understanding the trauma and the and the um, 
uh, displacement of 1948. So the Nakba is also, it, it, it's, it's in our mind, it's our psyche. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the fear of the Nakba, the fear of another Nakba. Palestinians do always fear that sort of thing. And, and, and so that's why uh, we, we need to not just remember it, but actually to say, look, we are still here. We are, we are not going to go. We are not. They have no, we have nowhere to go. Palestinians in Syria, as refugees, they've got nowhere to go. The only way to go is to go to Palestine. That's why uh, the, the Nakba is so central to uh, the future of Palestine and the pa Palestinians. And um, I, I think you did mention the word tragedy. Can I contradict you? Yes. Yes? <laughs> you can. I actually want to argue that Palestine is not a tragedy. Yes. Earthquake are a tragedy. You know, when earthquake, you can't help it. You know, a, a plane flying and suddenly crashing, it's a tragedy because no one plans it. Tragedies are something people, it happens to people, you know, a, an accident, um, a, a cyclist being run over, it's a tragedy. I actually argue that the Nakba was deliberate. It was planned. And this is one of the things actually, which actually distinguishes some of my work. If you plan something, it's a crime. Earthquake is tragedy. There's very little you can do about earthquake. They happen. They're natural things. They're natural phenomena. You know, it's about tsunamis and earthquake. These are real tragedies. The Nakba was deliberate. And the colonization of the West Bank is deliberate to stop the Palestinians creating their own state now. This is deliberate. What is happening in the, on the West Bank is not accident. It's, it's deliberately trying to undermine the possibility of Palestinian self-determination. So these things are not deliberate. They are crime. We need to call them. We need to call a spade a spade. The spade is spade. Crimes are crimes. Tragedy is something we, 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 we can come to terms with. Crimes, we need to acknowledge them. We need to name the criminals. We need to say who is responsible. We need to try to stop them. And, and that's why I think 1948 is a crime. That's why I think that settler colonization of the West Bank now is continuing the same crime. And that's the important thing about it. So I actually, um, uh, it's not a, an attempt to try to um, contradict you. Oh, okay. Not, yeah. um, but, it, but a lot of people actually say, well, it's Palestine, Israel is a tragedy. No, it's not a tragedy. It's more than tragedy. It's, 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 a it's continuous it's deliberate. You see it on television. You see it even on CNN and, 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 and the apartheid wall, which is really destroying villages and towns. And so we really need to acknowledge that thing. And with that acknowledgement, with that truth, we're going to have reconciliation in Palestine. We do need truth and acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And I think with that acknowledgement, yeah, can you hear me? Um, uh, in the way we acknowledge the Holocaust, we do acknowledge the Holocaust. It, it's a horrible thing happened to, to Jews in Europe, but, the, but the, what, what, the, the, the difference between the Holocaust in Europe and um, uh, uh, what's happening in Palestine, the Palestinians are actually continuing. The, the catastrophic situation is continuing. The Holocaust is something in the past, and we need to try to stop it here and now. Um, what about the British and um, British responsibility? I mean, I live in London. We want the British to acknowledge it. We want Theresa May to, she is celebrating Balfour. Can you imagine? The woman is actually planning to celebrate, not to commemorate. Theresa May is planning, not the opposition, not Jeremy Corbyn, not the opposition, but we have a prime minister, 100 years, not accepting responsibility. By the way, the British did apologize, apologize for India. They apologized for Amritsar massacre in India. The British, until today, did not apologize for catastrophic behavior in Palestine. This is something, actually, for, for us as a um, civil society, for us as diplomats in Europe, to try to say, look, you need to acknowledge the British behavior, actually. Without the British in Palestine, you would not have that catastrophic situation. Now, the Balfour Declaration. Now, the Balfour Declaration was on the 2nd of 1917, and it was... It was um, uh, it was the beginning of uh, something horrible which ended up with the Nakba. Um, you know, the British were imperialists um, and the Zionists were settler colonialists. I actually want to make a slight distinction between empire imperialism. I'm a historian. This is what we do. Lecture to students all the time. 
and trying to explain differences. Yes. The empires actually exploited people. The French in Algeria went to exploit, the French in Tunisia, in Morocco, the British in India went to exploit the country. Settler colonialism is far, far more dangerous. It's about replacing people. It's about displacing people. It's about ethnic cleansing. Zionist settler colonialism in Palestine wanted to push the Palestinians, it wanted the land without the people. The land without the people. So the British came and tried to exploit the country. They had the refineries in Haifa, and they exploited Iraq, and they, wanted, they had an empire, and they had India, and they had sort of thing. They came and went, by the way. Empires come and went. The settler colonialism is far more dangerous because they are here to stay, and they're still, they're still, they haven't stopped. They haven't changed. So I actually think that uh, here, when we talk about the British in Palestine, 1917, 1948, the British do bear responsibility. They do bear responsibility, and they have to acknowledge. And I would like them to apologize, although apology is not the main thing. The main thing is to change their policy towards Palestine. The main thing is to take responsibility and to stop Ashley. Theresa May should stop Ashley pandering to the Zionist lobby in London. Because I do think that British public opinion is changing. The public is changing. People are changing. People's views are changing. Um, civil society is changing in Europe. And it's changed. It has changed in the last 10, 15 years. People more, the fact that we can talk about the Nakba in this way in the last 10, 15 is a good sign. Public society, academics, the churches, the trade unions, lawyers, artists, actors, we have a lot of support in Europe, in Spain, in Britain, even in Britain. But the official level is still really bad. In Britain, that British government position is still following very much. Um, it's still kind of um, trying to um, uh, tag along Donald Trump. And I think this is one of the problems which we find it difficult is the way the British, the top is not changing. Uh, but we do have a lot of support, a lot of change, and we have a sea, I actually think we have a sea change in public opinion in Britain itself, in favor of Palestine. And, and as being an academic, I mean, when I, when I went to the UK in the, in the 80s to do my doctorate, I couldn't say I'm a Palestinian. Now we speak openly, we write, we publish. We have a lot of support among actors and, and lawyers and trade unionists and church. Even the churches are changing. The church is important. So we do have to mobilize our assets, and we do have to put Palestine back on the map. This is our chance, 2017. We still have to say that Palestine is the, still the issue. I know we have disturbances in the Middle East. I know, I know Syria is catastrophic, the Yemen is catastrophic. The regional situation is not helping us. I know that. We all know that. We know the Arab Spring has gone bad. We know things were optimistic and things hang. But we still have to say that Palestine is still the issue and will still be the issue and will come back to haunt us 10 years from now. And I think we have a lot of support. I mean, yesterday I was actually had an email from the uh, vice president of um, South Africa. Um, uh, is it Trump? Um, I forgot his name. Um, Phyllis, uh, I can't remember his name actually. Who's actually, he's actually fasting. Rama Boza, or something like that. Something else. He's actually fasting in support of the Palestinian prisoners. If we have that support, and I do think actually we have support from um, middle sized countries. Uh, Sweden, uh, we have support from small countries in Latin America. We have support not from the big powers, actually, the German, Germany and, 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 and Britain, and, but we have a lot of support on the official level from MPs across Europe. We need to mobilize this and we need to bring back Palestine into the heart of the conflict in the Middle East and to say Palestine is still the issue. This is our chance. I mean, as, as a historian, I think in two ways. There are two different types of people. There are people who wait for history to happen, and there are people who make history. And I don't think we should wait for history to happen. We should make history. We should bring back Palestine. We should mobilize the support we have on our civil society, among MPs, among officialdoms, anywhere to, 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 to do that. Because I, I think... Um, uh, uh, things on the outside, at least, outside, inside Palestine, things are very, very tough for people. People are still struggling, people are resisting, but on the outside, things are not always bad for us. And, and, and um, 
uh, because I have actually, I have talked a lot in this documentary, uh, and also I have um, books in, in Spanish. I'm actually going to stop here and allow people to have their say. And thank you so much for coming.